So we were looking at debt capital market and debt capital market instruments starting from last week. We looked at what debt capital market was. So before we step into studying about the market, what kind of a market it is, what kind of objective that the participants have, is something that we need to be aware about before we step into a market. So we know with what intentions the participants are entering into the market. So there we saw one of the main participants that we see is government and corporates because it's for their requirement that the debt capital market is heavily aligned to. They These two entities have some long-term capital requirements to cater to them is how the debt capital market is structured, all right? And we also saw when it comes to any capital market, you have primary market as well as secondary market. So similarly, when we talk about debt capital market, we can see a primary debt capital market and a secondary debt capital market. What are their functions and what they perform is explained in our prior lessons then what are the what is the main significance and importance of having this debt capital market i highlighted it to you yes you need this market for the efficient uh, dissemination of the monetary policy and what not uh, efficient allocation of resources yes but the main significance is this market provides the financing avenue for government's development activities. You know, when it comes to welfare related projects, development related projects that run more than one year. So to cater to such high level projects, you need long term, sometimes very long term financing. To cater to them, yes, you need a debt capital market. Similar to that for corporates, Money market helps them to run the business smoothly, catering to their working capital requirements. But for them to improve, for them to develop, expand, they have to tap into debt capital market if they decide on debt financing. And to address that, we need a debt capital market. Then we went through the participants. We know issuer and investor are like the hardcore must be must have participants in a market so who are who could be the issuers in a debt capital market who could be the investors in the debt capital market investors in the debt capital market again i reiterate mainly who we see are institutional investors why don't we see individual or retail investors like you and i one reason is we might not have that kind of a maturity appetite for example, you and I as individual retail investors would not be keen on investing in a treasury bond for 30 years. Okay, then that might not be our cup of tea. Or fun, the fund size, the amount we have. You and I as individual investors, the quantum of funds we have for investment could be very minimal. But if you take institutional investors, it could be pension funds, insurance funds, certain uh, debt uh, guilt edge funds, or they, when they have, for the funds they have, they could easily tap into this market and invest in high ticket sizes. Okay. So for those two reasons is why you see mostly institutional investors in this particular market. Who are the ancillary participants? providing support to this market. Yes, we see managers who help in the origination and even in the underwriting and even in the distribution stages of the debt capital primary market. What do they do? They help the issuer. They advise the issuer to arrange how to arrange the structure, how to whether to underwrite or not, how to distribute, how to market this issuance to the public. That's the role of a manager. Agent and trustee, remember, agent and trustee are two different parties. Who does an agent represent? Agent represents the principal. The interest of the issuer is what the agent is worried about. Trustee represents the investors, representative of the 
several hundreds of investors is a trustee. So trustee's motive is to ensure that the investors are safeguarded. Okay, so you can hire these two entities as well, these two individuals for their services in this debt structuring process. Finally, you have the trading infrastructure. You can have companies supporting you for the issuance, but you need the platform to issue and to trade on that instrument. So to provide that platform is where the trading infrastructure comes in. Then we saw the benefits and the disadvantages of choosing debt financing. Again, remember here we are comparing this to equity financing. And this decision making impacts or affects corporates. Do government have to worry about debt versus equity? No, you know, as an issuer, the government cannot tap into the equity market. They do not sell ownership claims. They can go for debt financing. But for a corporate, they have the choice. They can choose between debt or equity financing. So when they tap into the debt financing, what are the advantages they get in comparison to equity? What are the disadvantages they get in comparison to equity? Again, here for debt financing, the biggest and advantage or the most significant advantages are the tax advantage and the certainty aspect you know for sure your commitments but if you take equity no it could vary depending on your profitability depending on how the shareholder reaction could be your payouts will change again for equity the dividend payout is not tax deductible so you don't get a tax advantage there as well. What are the disadvantages of debt financing? You have to have incur additional time cost and expense with relating to getting a credit rating. Sometimes you have to give a collateral. And if you rely too much on debt financing, it could impact or heavily drain out your cash flows. Okay. So with that, we moved on to debt capital market instruments. So we saw what, how, can, how does the market work, who are the participants and everything. Now we move into what are the instruments in this particular market. So in this market, we saw two main instruments, bonds, debentures. On a theoretical basis, these two are different. How bonds tend to be more long term in nature. They are issued by governments and government related institutions and therefore they can be less risky. Not only because of the issuer, most of the time bonds do come up as a secured instrument. Again, due to that as well, it tends to be less risky. When it's less risky, you need to understand interest rate is relatively low. Debentures in terms of tenor of the instrument, those are long term, yes, more than one year, but they tend to have a maximum of five years. The usual practical market norm tends to be more than between two to five years is the range that we see a debenture for. I had told you again, we saw recently in our market, there was a 10 year debenture. There can be instances that happening, but usually we see most of the de uh, debentures to be between two to five year ranges. Debentures are mostly issued on unsecured basis and they are issued by corporates. Due to these two reasons, again, they tend to carry a higher risk than bonds. Due to the higher risk, they tend to pay out a higher return in comparison to bonds. Types of bonds is what we were looking at last week. So treasury bonds, yes, issued by the government. If they're issued in their own currency, considered to be default risk free and hence considered to be risk free instruments. Again, remember when we use the word risk free instrument in terms of treasury bills, treasury bonds, it doesn't mean it is free from all risk. 
it refers that it's free from credit or default risk treasury bills and bonds similar to the other bonds are exposed to inflation risk the time cost maturity risks yes but in terms of a issuer risk is where you can say they are risk free all right sukuk bonds is something we are going to look into today for now remember these are bonds issued in compliance to the sharia law okay corporate bonds you don't see mostly in sri lanka these are bonds issued for long term financing by corporates convertible bond is where you see a bond being issued as a debt instrument until maturity it continues to be in the debt form but on maturity the investor has the option remember who has the option investor has the option either to take the principal back and exit from the bond or to convert the bond into equity shares green bonds is when you issue bonds but you raise money from that bond to finance a environment or sustainable related project then you refer to that bond that you issued for this purpose as green bonds for now hold on callable and puttable bonds junk bonds and investment grade bonds the comparison here depends on the risk rating if the risk rating is triple b and higher you call them investment grade bonds those are high grade bonds why the rating refers to the credit or default risk of the issuer so have to have a rating of triple b or higher or above means that the credit or default risk is very less minimal so you can have a confident yeah, that your money will come back yes it will be returned to you as agreed therefore investment grade bonds reflect a lower risk and when they reflect a lower risk they can issue it at a low interest rate but junk bonds the word itself tells you junk bonds mean bonds which are not of investment grade sometimes in certain text they call it speculative bond why these bonds you call you buy them on a speculative purpose as well why there is no investment rationale for you to invest in these bond the credit rating is so low now if you if for you to have a credit rating of below triple b meaning you definitely fall into the c grade or the d grade which means which highlights a high credit risk or a default risk it means that the country or the company is already in high debt already finding it difficult to meet their debt repayments so when such a message is given out for the in for a rational investor will put money into that obviously depending on the risk he needs a return yes but if you know there's a high probability that your money is going to go i mean going to vanish or going to be disappeared will you bet on it will you invest on it unless you're a risk taker no so most of the time the risk taking investors or rather speculators or traders get into these bonds as investors okay why you get in for a short time you earn a quick and a high return why it has a high risk for that high risk you expect a high return they earn the high return and get out of the bond issuer perspective when we talk about most of the time a issuer who will use a junk bond is a is at a high risk of default they can be highly levered or highly geared issuers sometimes a new uh, a new startup company who doesn't have a proper business or proper cash flow to pay out it can be a capital intensive company who have invested heavily on machinery through borrowings okay so when the credit risk or the leverage is so high for a company and they still issue a bond they can that bond can get a lower credit rating moment it gets a lower credit rating lower than triple b you name it a 
junk bond floating rate bond is when a bond has a interest rate pegged to a benchmark interest rate for example we studied about libor we studied about awplr these are market determined interest rates so when the interest rate of a bond is pegged to that what do, what do i mean by pegged it depends on that particular rate so when the market rate moves the interest rate of the bond also moves okay so floating rate bond the interest rate fluctuate depending on how the benchmark or the referent rate moves example is then you know, mostly what we see in the market is referent ra reference rate plus a particular margin this plus margin reflects the additional return the investor gets for example let's say libo plus 3% so the market determined whatever libo let's say weekly reported libo you are taking it so the weekly reported libo plus 3% so this week let's say libo was 0.1% so plus 3 meaning you get a interest rate of 3.1 next week when libo is 0.2 you get 3.2 so when the market rate fluctuates the return to the investor also fluctuates all right you then you have euro bonds and foreign bonds something that we have already discussed euro bond remember all three aspects continue to be uh, they continue to be different issuer is from a different country the instrument's currency is uh, not the domestic currency in which you are issuing and the country in which it is issued is a totally different country and it can, tends to be multiple countries okay foreign bond the instrument the issuing country and the instrument is issued in the same currency in other words the instrument is issued in the domestic currency of the country in which you are issuing but the issuer is not from the same country issuer is from a foreign is from a foreign country for example sri lanka looking into avenues to in a issue a samurai bond which means we are going to issue a bond but not in sri lanka we are going to issue it in japan and in what currency are we issuing it we are issuing it in yen we are issuing it to the japanese market in yen and raising funds for that for our requirement okay then it becomes foreign bond callable and puttable bonds this is a very important area that you need to be aware about a uh, probable topic that most of the students get confused remember what a callable bond is here issuer has the right what kind of a right does the issuer have either to call the entire bond or part of the bond before its maturity the issuer can call back can recall back the issued bond either entirely or let's say 50% of the bond at least is what a callable bond means it happens before maturity who gets the right issuer gets the right because issuer gets the benefit and the investor could be at a loss you have to when you are issuing this particular bond you tend to issue it at a higher interest rate on point of view of the investor what are the risks that the investor has investor has a reinvestment risk here why a callable uh, bond is exercised when the interest rates are low when in market interest rates decline and the bond in which you have already issued is of a high interest rate issuer can call back the bond and reissue at a lower interest rate when he is trying to reissue at a lower interest rate investor is going to lose the high interest he has got and now he is going to end up with a low interest rate okay so investor is exposed to reinvestment risk 
putable bond it tends to be the reverse of the callable bond here who gets the benefit the investor the buyer the person who invested in the bond has the right to get his money back before the maturity if not what happens money comes back only on the maturity date here because it's a putable bond investor can demand either the entire bond am entire investment amount or the part of the investment before the maturity date when will they exercise this they will exercise this when the market interest rates are increasing then does the investor have reinvestment risk no why he can reinvest now at a higher rate then the bond that he already invested in so putable bond helps the investor to safeguard against the reinvestment risk but for the issuer he is exposed to interest rate risk why when the interest rate is increasing he has he has to pay back the money now okay therefore issuer faces the risk at this point all right remember who gets the benefit who faces what risk and what kind of a benefit is received okay risk associated with the bonds or throughout here the main risk that you need to remember is the interest rate risk understand exchange rate risk is associated to a bond if the cash flow of that bond comes in forex if not exchange rates impact tends to be minimal on a bond okay yield curve risk is when uh, then there is a uh, movement in the interest rate when there is increase in the interest rate not pass down across the maturity on a parallel basis if it's not passed down correctly and the adjustment is non parallel where short term interest rate have moved higher and the long term interest rate have not moved at all or have moved lesser then it tends to be your the bond holder is exposed to the yield curve risk and reinvestment risk you already invested in a bond and on maturity you get your money back with the return but when you get your money back when you are trying to reinvest you have to invest at a lower interest rate why the market interest rate could have declined that exposes the investor to reinvestment risk for example if i had for think about this aspect if i put my money on a fd and the fixed deposit was giving me 15% for one year okay let now within that one year interest rates have declined now my fd is going to mature when it matures i want to again renew continue it when i am trying to renew fd rates have come down now i have to put the fd at only 6% so on reinvestment i am losing out i am losing 9% then for the investor that's a risk i'm going to get a lower return okay that's what it means for reinvestment risk in terms of a bond you invest on a high return earning bond but after on maturity when you get your money back when you're trying to reinvest you have to reinvest at a lower interest rate than the already matured bond okay remember it's the callable bond which is vulnerable to reinvestment risk we went through what the yield curve risk was with an example then we went through treasury bonds now government issues for securities mainly for securities in that you have two securities issued in local currency two securities issued in foreign currency what are the two local currency securities treasury bill and treasury bond we saw treasury bill in the money market lesson now we are going through treasury bonds treasury bonds are long term instruments 
again the issuance and the trading happens very much similar to a treasury bill okay the trading patterns and everything you have a primary market you have a secondary market you have primary dealer coming into auction and what not but here the main points that you need to note here is treasury bond is a long term instrument the purpose of issuance is different than why you issue a treasury bill the main features of treasury bonds you can see the maturity so far we have a maximum tenure of 30 years in which they are issued for and they tend to carry interest payment now treasury bills didn't have that why treasury bills were issued on discount pricing technique the treasury bill had a face value on issuance you sold it at a price lesser than this face value okay but treasury bonds there's no such thing here because it's a long term instrument can you just say you have a face value i'm going to give it at a discount no if it's a long term instrument it tends to be on a, a interest add on technique treasury bill because it was a short term instrument they were adopting a discount pricing technique here you have a coupon rate refers to the interest rate that you get that is calculated already pre agreed that is calculated and paid out every 6 months okay every 6 months the coupon payment is done principal comes or principal is paid out on the maturity date the systems involved in facilitating the transaction relating to treasury bonds remember that and now we are going to start from the two securities issued by the government but not in local or domestic currency in dollars in foreign currency our government issues sri lankan development bond and international sovereign bonds okay okay now just by going through these two names sri lanka development bond other one was international sovereign bond you should get one hint one carries a name of sri lanka development tends to have a very localized name the other instrument tends to carry a name referring to the international arena international sovereign bonds sri lanka development bond is a instrument issued yes in foreign currency but it is issued to the domestic market they issue it within sri lanka international sovereign bond are issued in foreign exchange or foreign currency terms but issued to the international market okay that's the main difference between these two instruments okay the main highlight between these two instrument is sri lanka development bond is issued to the domestic market international sovereign bond is issued to the international arena to the international market now based on this difference is where is how the other differences are built on okay so let's see each instrument individually so sldbs sri lanka development bonds are debt instrument issued by our government but in us dollars okay it's denominated in us dollar terms let's see the specific features of sri lanka development bonds these again tend to have a semi annual interest payment uh, agreement where every 6 months 
the interest is paid out or the coupon is paid out they are issued to the domestic market maturity period of the sltbs tend to be between 2 to 5 years very much similar to debenture tenors 2 to 5 years the minimum investment tends to be us dollar 10000 and then they are on you can increase on multiples of us dollar 10000 investment currency is on us dollars sri lanka development bonds can have their interest rate either fixed or floating but they are if it's a floating sri lanka development bond they are pegged always to the 6 month libo for usd why am i saying for usd i told you libo rate is calculated for five currencies okay for five different currencies libo rates are calculated because our instrument the sri lanka development bonds are issued in dollar terms you peg use the, the market interest rate as libo but what libo the dollar libo okay so libo for dollars is used what's the tenor they use 6 months why the interest payment happens every 6 months so for floating interest rate relating to sltb sorry sldb they are pegged to the 6 month dollar libo with a margin if it's a fixed rate it's just one fixed interest rate these bonds are issued in paper form or script form all right international sovereign bonds these was started to be issued from 2007 again they are issued by the government of sri lanka let's see the features of the isbs they also have semi annual interest payment they are issued to the international market maturity tends to be between 5 to 10 years where a bit of a long term instrument the currency in which it is issued tends to be dollars they you they have fixed coupon rates not floating coupon rates and they are issued in scriptless form why is this issued in scriptless form and not uh, sltbs this is a international sovereign bond can you send out paper documents to international investors all across the world hence it tends to be in a paperless form or a electronic basis i think very recent, very soon they will convert sltbs as well to scriptless form but for now it tends to be on script form okay another biggest difference between these two instrument is one is targeting the domestic market sldbs one is targeting the international market isb now in the domestic market is foreign currency being freely used can you use it for any purpose anywhere at any time there are certain regulations governing forex okay there are certain purposes for which it is authorized to there are certain limits for which they are authorized to even for a purpose there's a particular limit that they allow okay so in that context can this instrument have a active secondary market in sri lanka no this instrument doesn't have a active secondary market in sri lanka why the movement of forex tends to be limited but international sovereign bond can you say no secondary market to the international market no they buy the instrument with the hope of waiting until maturity they should have the ability to trade it in their markets hence isbs have a active secondary market all right that's a another difference between these two instruments 
similarities between these two instruments they are issued by the same issuer government of sri lanka issued in dollar terms interest payment tends to be every 6 months okay initial investments tends to be similar but all the other factors are its differences where it is issued the interest rates that it carries one carries both fixed and flexible but isbs are only issued in fixed rates sldbs are in paper form script form isbs continue to be at scriptless form the maturity sldbs tend to be between 2 to 5 years yes it's long term but not very long term instruments but international sovereign bond the the tenor tends to be between 5 to 10 years so it can be 7 8 that kind of a time horizon all right so understand where it is placed there for the government issued securities there are four only one falls into the money market all three other three falls into capital market in that only one is in rupee terms the other two are in forex terms all right sukuk or islamic bonds okay the final type of bond that we are going to see and then we move on to debentures what do you mean by sukuk bonds i told you before as well how do you define it these are bonds issued in compliance to the sharia law now if you take the sharia law according to sharia law they do not or they don't accept the word interest okay they want the money to have not they don't want the money to be in idle and get a return for them it should have some kind of a positive revenue generation and from that yes you can get a share but just having money and idling and then getting a interest that concept is not supported okay so in line with that is how the sukuk bond is designed or structured now if you take islamic banking the return comes in the form of profit sharing all right so when they were structuring sukuk bond they had to structure it in such a way that where you don't get a interest you get a profit share now when i talk about a profit share the sit hint on a debt instrument or the sit hint on a equity instrument if you think about dividend dividend is a share of profit is interest a share of profit no irrespective of whether the whether the company is getting a loss or a profit you are going to get your interest but here word is profit share if it's a profit yes you get a share of the profit but if it's a loss you have to get the share of the loss as well so designing or structuring sukuk bond was in such a way that sukuk bond had both features of debt instruments and of equity instrument it's designed in a way that it tends to have higher features from equity and very less features of a debt instrument why because this bond has to be in compliance with the sharia norms so this is structured in a way of asset back security these back a certain project certain business and backing that is how the bond is issued there needs to be certain activity which is earning a profit that backs this bond okay so you can't call sukuk bond as a complete debt instrument yes it has features of debt instrument but it has more features of equity to be specific a asset back security 
okay now the word sukuk represent ownership ownership of that underlining it can be asset project or business okay now if you are buying a sukuk bond you become or you have the claim on the backing asset or project you be, you have a ownership you have a interest on that activity why if that activity performs well and earns a profit then you earn your return for a debt instrument you are not bothered it's not ownership you can run it any way you want but get me my interest is going to be the worry but here you have a interest on that venture why you want the venture to earn a return because you are getting a share of that okay so when you invest on a sukuk bond you get the share of profit from that asset now what is the similarity that sukuk and conventional bonds have the only similarity is only similarity is it has a specific maturity date now equity do they have a maturity date no your owner you expect to hold the instrument for the foreseeable future therefore you don't have a maturity date there is no date in which the instrument expires but here remember it's a bond end of the day it has to have a debt feature in it by norm or by according to the religious reasons yes you can't have the interest component but that doesn't mean it cannot have the maturity date or the maturity feature so sukuk bond has a similarity to other bonds has a specific maturity date on that maturity date the issuer will buy back the bond okay but all the other features tends to be of a asset back security or equity instrument okay now i invest let's say 1000 rupees first year profit second year profit let's say third year it's a loss i lose out on my investment or let's say my return is going to come down and then fourth year is also loss fifth year is also a loss i still have to bear the loss why as per this bond i take or i have a part ownership i take interest in that underlying instrument so your initial investment like a share is not guaranteed there are situations where you might not even get that back you are exposed to the risk of the underlying instrument okay let's see the differences between a conventional bond and a sukuk bond now if you take conventional bond or the normal debt instruments do you get a asset ownership no your conventional bond indicates a obligation the issuer is bound to pay you back that's the obligation that it highlights but take a sukuk bond it doesn't notify a obligation yes on maturity they have to pay you back but sukuk bond reflects a ownership on that underlying asset if you buy today you become a part owner you become you take interest on that underlying asset you cannot neglect on let let it go anywhere it wants is not how you would act you have to take interest why your return is related to that okay so sukuk bond doesn't reflect a debt obligation aspect it reflects a asset 
ownership you become part owner to that underlining asset investment criteria now if you take a usual bond you can issue a bond for any purpose as long as that purpose is a legal purpose if i want to put up a factory if i want to expand my current uh, uh, expand my current factory with additional machinery if you want to venture into a new business or for all those reasons yes i can issue a bond as long as the business i do or the reason i issue or the reason for which i issue the bond is legally accepted okay the investment criteria tends to be the legal acceptance but sukuk bond not only the bond has to be sharia compliant your purpose or the asset tends to be comply to the sharia law as well you can't just worry about the legal or the usual regulatory laws and uh, laws and regulations of the country alone you have to ensure that the business endeavor that you do is complying to the sharia rules and regulations as well there are certain businesses there are certain activities prohibited so you cannot venture into those or you cannot raise money through sukuk bonds to fund for such activities issue unit each bond or each conventional bond unit represents a share of debt but when it comes to sukuk bond each unit represents ownership on that underlining asset due to this the value of that unit is based on the market or the underlining assets value but if you take the conventional bond the issuing price price at which you issue so is related to the face value why when we go through i will tell you how the face value impacts on your issue price the face value depends on the credit worthiness of the issuer or on the return that is giving on several reasons that will decide on your issue price whether you are going to give at the same face value whether your issue price is going to be the face value whether it's going to be higher than the face value or lower than the face value okay but sukuk bond the main concern is value of that underlining asset that will determine your issue price investment rewards and risk now you use the money by you know if you you issue a bond raise money and you use that money for certain expansionary activities and let's say it gives you a reward with high profits does that high return or high profits roll down to the conventional bond holder no let's say they you incur a loss massive loss does that loss or this the requirement to bear the loss come on the bond holder no because it's a debt obligation irrespective of what happens to the underlying asset you are bound to pay back your commitment if it's high profits your commitment is not going to increase that pre agreed amount is what you are going to pay back let's say you earn a loss doesn't mean your commitment is going to decrease you have to pay back that committed amount but for sukuk bond if it's a investment reward it increases the return to the bond holder but if it's a loss it will decrease the return to the bond holder they have to take they have to bear the loss as the part owners finally effect of cost yes you borrow money to put up a factory let's say you have cost overruns what do you mean by cost overruns you put a you plan out a project with a particular budget let's say you overrun the budget the actual requirement or actual financing is now going to be higher than what you have budgeted 
that would lead to a bad position why because if you have a cost run cost overrun you are going to find ways to finance that you might have to in borrow money on short notice at high interest rates that will lead to a loss situation this cost overruns if it is borne by the owner again profit of that venture is going to decline does this cost overrun impact a conventional bond holder no why their return or their commitment is fixed pre agreed but sukuk bond here your return depends on the profit so if there is a cost overrun which the owner has to bear their return is going to decrease if there is a cost overrun for which you need additional financing or short notes uh, short note on short note basis you are going to get financing at high interest rate again that's going to impact on your profits why that interest payment will reduce your profits okay so higher cost will result in lower return to the sukuk bond holder okay so see how the thinking differs sukuk bond tends to be highly biased towards the equity aspect why they are asset backed the return tends to be depending on the asset conventional bond your return is interest even if you don't use that money for that intended purpose you have to pay that agreed return agreed interest okay whether it's a loss or a profit or whatever scenario only similarity between these two is both have a specific maturity date on the maturity date you have to pay back whatever is remaining okay finally debentures so so far we went through bonds what the bonds what kind of bonds are available each type everything now we are getting into debentures again remember debentures mostly issued by corporates tend to have a tenor between 2 to 5 years okay this is a instrument that corporates issue for long term debt financing when they issue an a person subscribe for the debenture the debenture holder becomes a creditor to the company the company owes money to the debenture holder okay so on you here we uh, call similar to the other bonds you have a interest payment to be paid it can be annual or semi annual depends on the company's policy and on the maturity date you have to pay back your principal if you have borrowed certain money you have to pay that back on the maturity date okay that's how debentures work but you have different types of debentures based on certain features let's see what they are now i told you at the beginning itself there are certain instances where debentures tend to be issued on secured basis and in certain instances on unsecured basis so first classification is based on security if the debenture that you are issuing is coming on a secured basis in other words the debenture you issue comes with a certain collateral for example i am issuing a debenture and i am saying for this debenture the land i have let's say somewhere in down south is the uh, collateral that means that asset is specifically assigned to this debenture let's say i as the issuer fail to repay my interest or my principal then debenture holders can have direct claim on that particular property why that's the assigned security okay but you tend mostly on a practical scenario you see debentures on unsecured basis in other words you are issuing 
debentures with no specific security. So as let's say issuers default, then debenture holders have to go for legal action or maybe for winding up. Then you go through the winding up process and get your money back. Okay. So if it's secured debentures, much safer for you. But remember, secured debentures will give you lower interest. Based on interest rates also, you can classify debentures. If the debenture carries a fixed interest rate, it becomes a fixed interest rate debenture. If the debenture carries a variable interest, especially pegged to a benchmark or a market interest rate, then it becomes floating rate debentures based on redemption. Now we know debentures have a maturity date. So on that particular date, they are redeemable. The issuer can get back the debentures. The investors can get back their money. So debentures are issued highly for a fixed period. Most of the debentures tend to be redeemable debentures. But the in very rare situations, you see a type of debenture called non-redeemable debentures or irredeemable debentures. These are debt instruments, but these are not redeemed or matured during the life of the company. In other words, until winding up, this debenture will continue. Okay, it's on the winding up point that you will get your maturity, your maturity amount back. Okay, practically you see more of redeemable debentures, very rarely you see non-redeemable debentures and if there are non-redeemable debentures, mostly it is the owner of the company who himself subscribe for the non-redeemable debentures as well. You don't see outside parties or retail investors going mostly for non-redeemable debentures. The owner or the shareholder himself or herself can become a debenture holder as well. Based on records, if the debenture is termed as a registered debenture, then that debenture is assigned to one particular debenture holder, to you. You are the debenture holder. So the certificate carries your name, the company registrar, the, the register of debt debenture holders will also carry your name. So such instruments are not easily transferable, not negotiable. But where are debentures? Here the debentures could be merely transferred by just delivering that instrument. So there is no particular name assigned to the debenture or particular uh, so there is no register particularly in which you have the uh, names of the holders therefore the transferability is not affected in bearer debentures registered debentures yes it is restricted there is no transferability and no negotiability based on convertibility most debentures that you see tend to be non-convertible debentures. You issue them for a specific period. At the end of that particular period, you pay back the amount that you borrowed and you recall the debentures. That's the end of debentures. But recently you see more of convertible debentures where you issue a debenture throughout that time period in which you have issued it continues to be as a debenture but on maturity the investor has the option to convert it into equity or to take his money back that is called convertible debenture why do you see more of convertible debentures now why because it eases the drain on the cash flow for businesses 
Now, if it's a debenture on maturity, you have to pay back the principal as well. Let's say you're not prepared for that. Then you might offer shares. You can offer shares and ask them to convert it into shares. So if they convert, you don't have to pay the principal back. Okay. So that helps them to manage the cash flow on the final year. And another technique that most companies currently do is to avoid these drain on cash flows when debentures mature is to reissue or going for a fresh debenture just months before the maturity of the existing debenture. So they issue another debenture. Why? With the purpose to settle this maturing debenture. Okay. So that they can continue. They don't have to, if let's say they have issued a non-convertible debenture and they still have a drain on their financial. If they go for a payout on that uh, maturity date, then they can reissue another debenture, use that proceeds and settle this expiring debenture. It's, it's advisable to use it as a short term technique, not like a permanent scale. Why? If you, you can't forever do that and continue on one particular day. You have to pay back the debenture. So advisable to use it as a short lived technique or a short lived strategy, but not a permanent thing. Now, if you are analyzing companies, you have to see this. Now, there are certain entities, even in Sri Lanka, when one debenture matures, they reissue another debenture. So you will even see in their debenture prospectus purpose of the debenture issue to settle the expiring debenture. Okay. Advantages of debenture to the issuer and disadvantages of debentures to the issuer. Now, again, advantages of debentures are more similar to advantages of debt financing. You have the benefit of tax. The interest is tax deductible. The amount is already known, your commitment amount. No ownership dilution. By issuing a debenture, the holder doesn't become owner of that company. Okay. Your profits are not diluted. You don't have to share your profits. The debenture holder has less interference into business matters. Now here, main word I'm using is less interference. I'm not saying no interference. I'm saying less interference. When we go through the terminologies of the bonds, you will understand why. And debentures are carry a low, sorry, debentures carry a low issue cost than equity. Why are we saying that? You will be wondering how can you say debenture have low issue cost? You have a credit, you need to take a credit rating. You need to, uh, you know, make sure the credit rating is triple B and above. You have to market your issuance, everything. So how can you say issue cost is less? Why we say issue cost is less? One is when the benefit of tax advantage, uh, uh, tax advantage is taken into consideration, the cost reduces. Okay. Other aspect is here, only major cost is you going for a credit rating. But if it's an equity instrument, you have a lot more regulation to cover. You have to have a proper prospectus, a manager and everything. And then you have to get CSC clearance, regulatory clearance. Why? You're trying to get on board equity holders. You have to get listed. Okay. For those listing procedures, the regulations are much more tighter than for debentures. Hence, debentures tend to have low issue cost. Disadvantages of debentures to the issuer, you have to pay interest. You cannot default it. You cannot delay it. You are obligated. Then the capital that you raise here. Yes, we call it capital. But is it really capital? You have to repay that amount. It's a borrowing. That capital is borrowed capital. You have to pay back. Therefore, there is a 
high drain on your cash flows increasing gearing level of the company if you heavily rely on debenture based on these advantages then borrowing of the company increases and gearing level will increase or skyrocket at times if your company is entirely running on borrowings and there is a complete drain in terms of interest will there be adequate profit left no okay so disadvantage of debenture is if you rely too much your gearing levels will increase finally imposing covenants yes there is less interference to business matters but debenture holder can impose covenants especially if the holder is a very prominent or a significant holder then they can impose covenants on the business there are two types of covenants again when we go through the terminology of bonds we will go through them so having gone through debt capital market debt capital market instruments now we are going through bond terminology and valuation this is like the heart of your lesson we had the introductory part we saw what the market is what kind of a instrument now we are getting into the techniques of that instrument how is this instrument valued when issued how it is going to get traded how are the returns calculated what influences its price and interest rates are going to be our focus okay <coughs> bond terminology now these are certain terms that you will come across when you are engaged in bond trading or bond related investment okay now principal amount what do you mean by principal amount it is the amount that is paid to the holder of a bond at its maturity okay on maturity the amount that you pay back is referred to as the principal amount you can call this as par value sometimes as face value as well now you might think why am i defining principal amount referring to the maturity date why aren't we saying it's the amount that the investor invests why can't we say that you can't because when you go through this lesson you will identify yes in treasury bills we saw discount pricing okay we saw discount pricing that pricing technique may not be entirely used in bonds but for certain bonds there can be a difference between issue price and face value okay so to properly define your principal amount you will refer it to to the point of maturity on maturity the amount or the uh, principal that you will receive or the capital amount that you will receive is what you call as the principal amount this all is also termed as par value or face value of that particular bond okay the real value of that bond is what you call as the principal value or principal amount the value of the bond or the principal amount is going to be your basis when you are calculating interest payment now this principal amount is not going to fluctuate when the, this particular amount when whenever interest rate increases or decreases 
it's going to remain unaffected why it is the face value of the bond it's not the market price of the bond remember it is the market price of the bond that is going to fluctuate when the interest rate changes okay principal amount is the face value or the actual value of that particular bond that will remain unchanged it's pre agreed unchanged that hence that will be your reference or that will be your base amount when you are calculating your interest payment issue date issue date is the date on which the bond that you have put to offer let's say from the issuer point of view i offer a bond for you to purchase it let's say the day i offer and my offer is settled by you giving me the money is the issue date of that particular bond okay it's the day in which the cash is transferred to the issuer and the bond certificate moves to the investor why is this issue date important because it is from that particular day that the bond will be activated what do you mean by activated it is from that particular day that the bond will start to earn interest it has to be issued right to get interest so issuing day is the day that issuer got the money investor received the bond certificate okay so from that day onwards yes bond is all issued hence from that particular day onwards interest has to be calculated hence issue day takes a huge prominence why interest calculation starts from this particular day maturity date what do you mean by maturity date it is the expiry date of the bond the date in which the bond will mature and the issuer has to pay back the principal amount and the final coupon payment on maturity date there are two cash flows cash inflows to the investor cash outflows to the issuer what are the two you have to pay back the principal and you have to pay back the last interest payment the last coupon payment okay that date is going to be your maturity date coupon rate now i told you coupon is another word that they use for interest especially relating to the bond issuance or bond trading what do you mean by coupon rate it is the annual rate of interest that the bond issuer if i am issuing the bond i agree to pay to the bond holder okay here the key term is going to be annual the coupon rate let's say they give the coupon rate as 10% remember it is a 12 month rate that they are giving most of the students when they get a bond calculation and they get a coupon rate and the question asks calculate the 6 months interest they simply take the entire coupon rate and charge you need to understand the coupon rate is a 12 month rate if they ask you the dividend payment amount for the first 6 months you have to adjust it for the time you have to divide it by 2 and get the coupon amount coupon rate when never given as a standard or just a figure it is a annual rate that they are talking about okay so who pays the coupon amount or who pays that particular rate the bond issuer why he borrowed money he has to pay the interest 
coupon amount or the coupon rate will go to the bond holder how is this coupon rate calculated it is calculated based on the <coughs> it is calculated based on the par value of the bond or the face value of the bond the coupon payment is calculated based on that so when you are trying to arrive or calculate the coupon rate you have to think about two uh, remember two things here total annual is a word that you need to remember this is the key word that you have to remember why you they can give you 6 months coupon payment amount and ask you to calculate the coupon rate but remember numerator is the 12 month coupon payment for a year what's the coupon payment amount divided by the par value why are they using par value here they can use market value no why are they using par value this is the agreed coupon rate will the issuer agree to pay interest rate based on the market rate no the issuer will decide the coupon rate based on the par value 10% of the par value is the agreed interest rate okay similar to discount rate of what we saw in uh, treasury bill why it depends on the face value depending on the face value the discount is decided okay similar to that coupon rate is decided based on the par value of the bond so these two aspects you have to remember now this coupon rate we saw it can be a fixed coupon rate or it can be a floating coupon rate okay if the coupon rate is fixed for example 5% so in let's say it's a 5 year bond throughout the 5 year every year 5% is going to be your coupon amount okay that's fixed already decided for but floating rate means it is linked or pegged to a market rate or a benchmark rate whenever the benchmark rate moves up the interest rate will move up fixed rate fixed rate coupon bonds are the most common type of fixed income security that you will see in the market why certain investors most of the investors prefer this because your income is predetermined and fixed in a time the interest rates are declining fixed interest rate could be a helpful buffer okay now fixed interest rate also has its disadvantages what are the disadvantages the interest rate risk of a fixed rate coupon is very high if you can note it down on the side just mention it interest rate risk of a fixed rate coupon bond is higher why am i saying that let's say on issuance i agree to pay you 5% that's fixed for 5 years at that time market interest rate let's say was at 6 because uh, let's say it's at 4 and i agree to pay at 5 now the market interest rate is increasing it's at 13 12% percent. 
aren't you losing out as a bond holder let's assume no callable feature no puttable feature nothing like that just the conventional bond aren't you losing as a holder yes what are you losing other instruments are having a high interest rate okay you have already invested in this five year bond let's say you are trying to sell this five year bond in the secondary market can you get a better price all the other investors will say why am i coming and buying a 5% coupon bond market is giving me 13% so you the current bond holder will have to sell at a very low price and incur a loss that is the interest rate risk so fixed rate coupon bonds are exposed to high interest rate risk that's why i have mentioned here prices of fixed rate coupon fluctuate more when the prevailing market interest rate change why the return is fixed here even though it is a benefit but because it is fixed whenever the market rate fluctuates the price of the fixed rate coupon will fluctuate more okay and i have given an example as to why it will fluctuate like that but take a floating rate coupon floating rate coupon they are exposed to some level of interest rate risk yes but the exposure or the extent to or the exposure of that risk tends to be lesser than fixed rate coupon bonds why if the market rate is increasing your benchmark rate is going to increase now for example if i say libo plus 3% okay if libo is 1% you will get the four okay your return will be four let's say libo goes to 2% your interest rate will be five so whenever the market rate moves your return is going to move as well but think about a fixed rate bond fixed rate at 5% there'll be no change irrespective of the market interest rate moving your return is not going to change at all so in comparison to that a floating rate bond will have lesser interest rate risk but why am i saying lesser interest rate risk? i can say no interest rate risk why am i saying that because this yes there is a floating interest rate but how often is this reviewed how often are you going to reprice the libo that will decide your extent of the interest rate risk for example most of the time when there is a floating rate bond you will reprice it every 6 months okay you take a 6 months libo if you decide let's say 1st of january you take the 6 months libo plus 3% let's say that was 1 One plus three is four. So from first January to thirtieth June, you are going to have this as your return. Why you repriced on the first, and that's now fixed for six months. So within these six months, if the LIBOR shoots up, 
you are exposed to interest rate risk let's say within this 6 months libor has moved to 2% on february onwards libor was at 2 so all the other all the other entities were getting 5% whereas you were getting only 4% so until the 6 months end you will continue at 4% but on 1st july when you reprice again you get the new libo so you don't on if you take a fixed coupon bond that impact is going to be there forever but here you can review it you will get the benefit but after some time therefore you cannot say no you it's a lesser interest rate exposure compared to fixed rate coupon okay i hope you understood the frequency of reviewing the benchmark rate depends on the particular time period of the benchmark rate selected for example if the coupon rate is linked to 6 months libo you very practically you can see only 6 months being used most of the time relating to bonds if you take loans you can see 3 months and what not but you, you most of the time if it's a bond you see 6 month libo being used okay if you are using 6 month libo the review happens after the 6 months it means at the end of every six months, the rate of the following period will be decided based on the LIBO at that point plus 2% spread. Okay. So here, rate of this following period, rate of this particular period is decided by the LIBO rate that is available on 30th June they will use that and fix it for this particular period all right hence there is an interest rate risk but not so much as a fixed rate coupon bond okay current yield current yield is another aspect of looking at your return but here look at the term current yield what do you mean by yield your return current return is what the current yield is going to reflect to you so current yield is the annual return earned on the price paid for a bond if i am buying a bond today at its existing price what would be my return for a year? Okay, that's what the current yield will tell me. But look at the word they have used, yield. Whenever we use the word yield, I told you, we talk about the return in comparison to my investment. I told you, when we went through the term principal amount, did we define it by the amount the bondholder invests? No, I didn't use that as the definition. I told you principal amount is the amount paid back on maturity. So if we are talking about my investment to calculate the yield, what is going to be my investment? the price I paid to buy that bond. Hence, it is the ongoing current market price that we are going to focus about. The return you compare it to the current market price because if I am buying the bond today, what's going to be my return for the another 12 months? So today my investment will be the current market price. You take that. What is going to be your return? Coupon payment. So over 12 months, what is my coupon payment amount? Take that as your return. Compare, you will get your current yield.
can you see the difference the numerator is the same but your denominator is where the difference is going to be both equations or both returns are going to depend on your coupon payment coupon payment for next 12 months but coupon rate tells you the interest amount agreed by the issuer the bond in its own value based on its value will give you a return about this much but current yield it tells talks about the holders return holders yield so to talk about yield to the owner or to the holder you have to compare your return which is annual coupon payment with your investment amount is par value your investment amount in some situations only but mostly it's going to be the ongoing market price the current yield if i buy today what's going to be my return so you compare that with the current market price to arrive at the current yield percentage see how the different works this is very similar to comparing the discount rate with the annual yield when we talk about treasury bills remember they are also we saw discount rate use the face value annual yield use the purchase price same thing happening here we have a question here if a bond with a par value of 1000 pays 80 rupees as a annual coupon and has a market price of 1032 what is the current yield of the bond what will be the yield if the price decreases to 969 let's say depending on this particular price your current yield is going to be 7.75 but if the market price reduces to 969 the current yield is going to increase to 8.65 why has current yield increased because the investment amount has decreased earlier you had to invest 1032 to get 80 rupees but now you can get the same 80 by only paying 969 so your return is going to be higher but in this exercise I want you to know two things. One is, irrespective of how the price changes, market price changes for the bond, the coupon rate remains intact. What is the coupon rate? Eighty divided by thousand. That's going to be your coupon rate. Okay. not the coupon amount i'm talking about the coupon rate coupon rate is going to be 80 divided by 1000 okay 80 divided by 1000 will be how the coupon rate is calculated 8% all right that 8% will be unaffected why whether the market price changes or not your coupon rate is going to remain the same that's the pre agreed rate but can you see when the market price fluctuates what gets affected current yield so current yield of a bond increases when price of the bond decreases in other words current yield is inversely related to the price of the bond if the market price of a bond decreases yield of that bond is going to increase if the price of the bond increases the current yield will decline and whenever market price changes
coupon rate doesn't change current yield is the only component that's going to change okay that particular those two uh, relationships you need to remember coupon frequency period what do you mean by coupon frequency period or coupon period here we are talking about how often is this coupon paid out to you whether it's monthly semi annually annually that frequency is important frequency meaning in a year how often are you paid coupon let's say annually coupon frequency is going to be one if it's semi annually coupon frequency is going to be two if it's monthly coupon frequency is going to be 12 coupon frequency is how often is this coupon payment going to be paid to you so in a year if it's going to be paid only once then it's annual if it's 12 times then it's monthly okay so coupon period is going to be decided on that if it's a an annual coupon payment coupon period is going to be one year if coupon frequency is going to be monthly coupon period is going to be per month if it's semi annually coupon period is going to be six months okay so the frequency decides on the coupon period accrued interest now this is another important concept when it comes to bonds now i told you the issue date is a important date by from the date you issue interest rate is calculated okay for example from the day you are born your age keeps increasing one day two day one month baby three month baby it keeps increasing so, but what is the starting point the day you were born similar to that if you take a bond the day it is born is the issuing date so from the date you issued interest has to be calculated okay so every day there is a interest turned let's say every day you are earning 2 rupees as interest okay so if i am issuing a bond today tomorrow it earns 2% why one day is gone day after tomorrow it earns another 2 rupees then what is my accrued interest 4 rupees if another day goes accrued interest becomes 6 rupees another day goes accrued interest becomes 8 rupees like that every day daily interest is accumulated it's accrued but how often it is paid out do you pay out interest every day the is the interest paid to the bond hold every day no that depends on the coupon frequency if it's monthly let's say it's a monthly coupon payment then interest is accrued every day until end of the month and at the end of the month that accrued interest is fully paid then next month again freshly interest rate is started to calculate again from the beginning of the month it will get accrued 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 and then at the end of the month entire accrued interest is paid out okay so the diagram goes something like this let's say this is 
one month okay this is first january so from day one interest is accrued now why is it increasing like this i am talking about accrued interest so i told you daily if you earn 2 rupees on day 1 it's going to be 2 day 2 it's going to be 4 day 3 it's going to be 6 8 10 hence every day your accrued interest is increasing now this is going to continue until the payment date so on this date the coupon is going to be paid out so when it is paid out on that payment date when the payment is done is there any accrued interest left no accrued interest becomes zero then again next month from the beginning of the month interest is accrued until the payment date again on payment date the entire amount is paid out that's how accrued interest work why is this accrued interest important to us why are we studying this on trading day, let's say now these bonds are traded every day. Am I going to hold on to the bond, wait until my coupon is paid and then on the coupon payment date, am I going to sell to you after getting the coupon? Practically no. On the day the price looks good to me, I might sell. That can be any day here. I can sell on this particular date. I can sell on this particular date. Any date in between before a payment is done or after a payment is done, I can sell. Okay. So on that selling point, for you to calculate the value of the bond correctly, you need to understand this concept of accrued interest. Accrued interest is the interest earned daily. See the keyword here? It is earned. You earn it, but you don't get paid daily. You, you have the right. It is accumulated to you daily and is paid out periodically in installments as coupon payments. For example, let's say ma, ma, my face value of the bond is 100. 10% is going to be the coupon rate. So what is my annual coupon amount? 10. For a year, I should get coupon of 10 rupees. So if the coupon payment is done every 6 months, end of June you get 5 rupees, end of December you get another 5 rupees. Hence, it will tally to the annual payment amount. Hence, that's why they say it here, pay it out periodically in installments. So, the 10 rupees is paid out according to the periods in portions, in installments. Until then, the interest is earned. Accrued interest is the interest accumulated since principal investment or since a, bo a bond's last interest payment date up to the current date or date of valuation. Now you, here can you see this is also accrued interest. It is starting from the day you invested. Or it can start from the date of last coupon payment. 
it, the starting date can be any point. It can be from the very first date, from the issue date, or from the date of last coupon payment. How is it? How is it calculated? You know, coupon rate is going to be calculated based on face value. The coupon amount, payment amount, is going to be calculated based on face value. Therefore, face value into coupon rate divided by the coupon frequency. Why am I dividing it by the coupon frequency? This coupon rate is for a year. Coupon frequency tells you how often in a year are you going to pay this. If your interest rate is 12% and your coupon frequency is monthly, then frequency will be 12. So 12% 12 coupon rate is divided by 12, which means every month, every coupon period, you earn 1% of the face value. Okay. Now this 1% you're going to adjust. 1% is going to be earned in a coupon period. Hence 1% divided by the number of days in the coupon period multiplied by the number of days after the last coupon payment. This is the day conversion factor. Here, face value multiplied by the coupon rate, which is talking about one year, the annual coupon rate is what we are talking here. This annual coupon rate is now adjusted or divided by coupon frequency. Then what does this give you? This will give you the coupon rate the coupon rate for one coupon period let's say the coupon period is for a month for a month what is the coupon rate you can find that out so when you multiply that amount by the face value you will get the coupon payment in amount terms. Now that amount will tell you in one coupon period. This is the amount that you will get. If I'm talking about the diagram, you will know what's the amount for this entire time here. This, this amount is what you're going to calculate. Okay. After knowing that, now let's say the payment happened in this date. Now you need to know until this date how much is the accrued interest. You know the entire coupon amount for this entire triangle. But you now need to know only for this point. Then what do you do? You divide this by... You will divide this entire answer by the number of days in a coupon period. Let's say I'm talking about a month. So number of days in the coupon period will be used to divide this particular amount. Why am I doing that? Hence, then I will know for one day what is the coupon payment amount? For one day, what's the coupon payment amount? Okay. After knowing that, what am I going to do? I'm now going to multiply again by the number of days 
since the last coupon payment date in other words since this last day how many days have gone by then for a day i know how much is the coupon payment amount then i know i will now know the number of days after the last payment when i multiply i will know for this particular date how much is the accrued interest okay now when you do it practically you will understand we do the calculations you will understand this formula now in this formula a tricky thing is counting this days now you know the practically even you can count days in any any way there will be some person who is using for a year 360 days as the assumption one person using 365 days as the assumption okay one person will say no for a leap year one additional day so there is another different day count they will use now because it is a international financial term the day count here is regulated there are day count conventions that you have when you calculate the days so if you are calculating accrued interest usually that comes with this day count convention you will say accrued interest calculated based on actual to actual day count then they will know by using what basis you calculated that accrued interest okay so you have three basis to count the to have the day count actual versus actual or you can call it actual versus 365 l it means you will use the actual number of days in a year or actual number of days between two days when you are doing this calculation so let's say in a year and that particular year is a leap year then you will use exactly 366 days if it's a normal year you will use 365 days as the actual number of days in a year okay you are going to use the actual number of days to do this calculation let's say they are not going for actual to actual but they are going for 30 to 360 day count here it is assumed every month has only 30 days and a year has only 360 days that's the assumption okay so if you are doing your day count Uh, if you are doing your accrued interest calculation and you have to find the number of days since the last payment day let's say uh, it happened uh, on the 15th of august or it happened on 30th of september you will take one month as only 30 days you will disregard 31 you assume as 30 and for a year there is only 360 and do the calculations okay actual versus 365 here you will take the actual number of days between two days and assume that a year has only 365 days so you disregard the leap year day count okay so here actual number of days between two days but you assume a year has only maximum of 365 days so when you get accrued interest calculations they will give it to you with the day count convention they will give you on what basis you are going to calculate your accrued interest but let's say they are silent in that question what do you do you all are knowledgeable students you all are going to write the assumption saying okay i am using this day count and doing the calculation you can use any method but what i recommend to you is internationally what's accepted or what's practically done is actual to actual day count okay so you can use that when you do your calculations why is this important to us 
why are we learning this now think i am the bond holder okay i am the initial bond holder let's say on this particular date after i got the coupon on this particular date let's say a monthly coupon payment in the mid of the month i'm trying to sell my bond okay and when i sell my bond the initial bond holder to one of you you will get the bond and you will receive at the end of the month the entire month's interest is that fair have you been holding that bond for entire month no you bought that month only mid of the month so rationally fairly a 15 day interest going to you is correct but if i just sell you the bond without adjusting for accrued interest you are now entitled for the entire interest so if i sell i should be aware mid of the month i'm selling i'm going to lose the entire month's interest all right so knowing that what most of the investors do is they calculate the interest rate they calculate the accrued interest and they will accommodate that accrued interest amount to the price as well okay i will say okay bond price is this this is my accrued interest so you pay me that as well by end of the month you will get the entire interest so you pay me the accrued interest now itself okay so if i am selling to a new bond holder or a new buyer and if my price includes the accrued interest rate then you call that price dirty price why why am i calling it dirty price it's the accepted word that you use because the price is not only the value of market value of the bond that is market value of the bond or market price of the bond plus accrued interest okay because it's a combination of both you call it dirty price if it's clean price meaning there is no accrued interest factor i am purely selling it cleanly selling it on market price okay so if the price does not include accrued interest it is called a clean price of a bond if it includes accrued interest you call it dirty price of the bond okay so with that we have come to our time we have just two more concepts to go through yield to maturity and covenants where we have two types of covenants i need to, to go through and then we get into calculations bond valuations the four steps in which you can calculate a uh, bond value and then how you identify whether a bond is correctly priced overpriced or underpriced and there are on we have the technical aspects of going into bond valuation okay so with this we will wind up for today and again we'll meet again next week last week i couldn't uh, uh, share the weekly questions out with you but don't worry this week definitely i will share the weekly questions out all right thank you so much for joining in and listening i hope it was clear to you all if you have any doubts drop a email i will get back to you all right thank you so much for listening in we'll meet again next week